Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so we thank you, Lord, for our time together today and for the gift of your word, which is coming to nourish us and to feed us. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, so, um, like, uh, what leads me to this is our gospel reading from last week, which there's always a lot of confusion about that. And that is Jesus uh, driving the uh, vendors from the temple in Jerusalem. So let's listen to that gospel reading. So listen to this uh, um, reading from John's gospel. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and the oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture that says, zeal for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. Now, this reading is from John's Gospel. It is the last of the four Gospels that are present in the New Testament that we have. John's Gospel was written between the year 90 and 100. The cut-off age of any writing making it into the Bible was 100. So the Gospel of John barely made it into the Bible because when the church decided which writings would be put into the Bible in the year 382 when the bishops met at the Council of Carthage the cutoff age was given as the year 100, so anything below 100 would not be included 
anything above 100 would not be included in the Bible. So only writings that were written before the year 100. And John is probably written around the year 100. So it's the very last writing to make it into the Bible. The writer of the Gospel of John is writing to a Jewish community of Christians. So Christians who have converted to Judaism and they are being persecuted many, many times and in many ways by Jews themselves. So they feel persecuted by Jews because they have now converted and become Christians. So they are Jews who used to be Christians. So they would know the Jewish religion very well. They're very well acquainted with the Jewish religion. Now this is written around the year 90 to the year 100. The center of the life for Jews, for their faith, their religion, the center of Jewish religious life is the temple in Jerusalem. The temple in Jerusalem. Today when you see images from Jerusalem and you see Jews, they're always at the Temple Mount uh, where there's just a wall left over. It's called the Wailing Wall because people go there and they cry. And you see the Jews there in Jerusalem by the wall with their heads like this and they're praying. And then they put pieces of paper inside of the wall. Well, that wall are the remains of the Temple in Jerusalem. And the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Emperor Titus in the year 70. So about 20 to 30 years before the writing that we have just heard. So the center of Jewish religious life was destroyed by the Roman Empire. The Emperor Titus, he wanted to punish the Jewish people for their rebellion. They had orchestrated one of the rebellions uh, to rebel against the Roman oppression and Roman rule. And in the year 70, he destroyed the temple to punish them. And when the temple was destroyed for the Jews, so was their religious fervor. So was their religious life. They thought that when the temple was destroyed, God was destroyed. Their religion was destroyed. Their faith was destroyed. Because for many Jews, such as the ones that this is being addressed to, and that's why it says the Pharisees were there, very fervent Jews, very observant Jews. The Pharisees were very observant Jews. They took their faith very seriously, their religion very seriously. What was important was the outside. Remember all the laws that they would keep, making sure that you don't eat this, you don't eat that, that you cleanse this, you don't cleanse that. So the outside was very important, as was the temple in Jerusalem. And so when the temple is destroyed, the religion is destroyed because they're so focused on the outside. Buildings are very important. And Jesus is trying to say something very different here. He, the Bible here says, Jesus went into the temple. Now why would they write about Jesus going into the temple when the temple doesn't exist? Because the Bible here this writer of the Bible is not talking about a physical temple. Jesus didn't go into a physical temple. He didn't go into a building. It says, you know, Jesus is in Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves as well as the money changers in the temple. There is no temple. So what is the writer talking about? And the Jews would understand this very well because there is no temple and they would make the connection because of Jesus' teachings. 
What is he talking about? He's talking about the temple which is us. That they are the temple. We are the temple. The Bible teaches us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is present in the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. First letter of Paul to the Corinthians when he talks about the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. 1 Corinthians 6.19 The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you are God's temple. God is in you. That's what the Bible is trying to teach us here. That you are God's temple. God is in you. God is not dwelling in some building. Buildings can be destroyed. Why are you so focused on the outside, in other words? This is what uh, Paul is trying to say. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You are the temple. That's what he's talking about. So Jesus here enters the temple and he drives out from the temple the money changers, the sheep, the doves. He drives out all the material stuff. He's driving out all the stuff. And that's what he wants to do with us. He wants to enter our temple. He wants to enter you to drive out from you all that stuff. Jesus entering the temple is Jesus entering us. And what did he do? He drives out the money changers. When you are so fixated on money, he wants to drive you out drive those things out of you when you're so focused on the sheep, the oxen, all that is outside, your material possessions. He wants to drive them out. And what did he do? He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he spurred the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. So is your life a marketplace, in other words? Are you prostituting yourself? Are you a prostitute? Do you prostitute yourself out to your work? Huh? I mean, you're, you're, you're selling your temple. You sell yourself for your work, sell yourself for money, do you sell yourself to other people, hmm? are you selling yourself to someone or something, selling yourself for a bigger home, all I need to do is work and work and work more in order to get more money, in order to get a bigger car, more money in my bank account. Are you selling yourself for vacations? I need to. I need to do all that I can in order to have a better body, to look better so that somebody's going to like me. Are you selling yourself for that person? He wants to drive out that marketplace attitude from us. He made a whip and he drove them out. And that's what he wants to do with us, with our temple. Drive it all out. Clean. Clean us. Clean our temple. The Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. Everything else. Not seek all that is outside. There's nothing wrong with having money 
If the love of money, that's the problem. If I love money or stuff or other people more than I love God, that's where the problem comes in. And Jesus spills all of that and says, take these out of here. That's what he wants to do to each and every one of us. He wants to say to us, take those attitudes that are enslaving you, the attitude of prostituting yourself, take it out of you, take it out of you, stop it, take them out of here, take them out of my father's house. Where is his father's house? It's inside of you. That's why Jesus says, you know, we're looking for the kingdom of God everywhere. When he says, the kingdom of God is within you. God lives within you. God is in us. Not outside of us, but in us. And God is peace. You want to look for peace outside of you? Unless you have peace inside of you, you're not going to ever have peace. You could have wars raging on all around you, but when you have peace inside of you, when your temple is clean, that's what brings you real peace. You know, Jesus says, the poor we will always have with us, meaning there's always going to be poverty. There's always going to be war. There's always going to be disease. There's always going to be problems. We pray for peace in the world. The world is never going to be a peaceful place. There's always going to be madmen. There's always going to be one King Jong Un after another. Before we had Hitler, now we have other ones. Stalin, you know, we had all. It's always been like that. Look at the history. Look at during this time, the Emperor Titus or Herod. There's always those people. Peace is about having peace inside of you. That's why Jesus says, my peace I leave you. It's not the peace the world gives, but it's the peace I give. It's the peace that comes with a change of attitude inside of you. It's about you. Take these out of here and stop making my father's house and my marketplace. Is your life a marketplace? His disciples recalled the words of scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal. Are you a, do you have some zeal for God's house? If you have zeal for God's house, you should have zeal for your own life. To have peace. To live forgiveness. In your life. To live free of grudges. What is it that you, maybe you've sold yourself to hate, grudges, resentment. Then you've sold your life, you've sold your soul. You can sell yourself to hate, or grudges, or resentment. You sell yourself for gossip, you sell yourself to the casino. You sell yourself, sell yourself to the bottle or to some drugs or, you know, you could sell yourself. What profit is there, Jesus says, for a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And how many lose their soul in the marketplace of the world? How many lose their soul in the marketplace of the world. That's what Jesus wants each and every one of us to avoid. That's why, what are you doing in order to get all the stuff inside of you in order? And this, the Jews answered and said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple in three, in three days and I will raise it up. The temple is already destroyed. The temple doesn't exist when this is written. Jesus, the Jews said, the temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. And here the Bible clarifies everything for us, which you missed. That's why I needed to point it out to you. Because you, this is the, the clue here is, it's, it's right in here, it says, but he was speaking about the temple 
of his body. That Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body. And Jesus' body is what? Let's go to 1 Corinthians again 12. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us what is the body of Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are Christ's body. You are Christ's body. And individually, parts of it. Some people God designed in the church to be apostles, second prophets, and he goes on and tells us about everything. But the point here is that we are the body of Christ. You are Christ's body. So he's speaking about his body, which means he's speaking about you. You are the temple. He's speaking about you and me. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe. And now, the last ver verses here says, but Jesus would not entrust himself to the Jews because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He understood it well. He knows how our human nature is. He knows where our passions are, that our passions are in pleasure and in stuff. Is that where your passions are, to get pleasure out of your money? Gives you a lot of pleasure to see your big bank account. Is that where your pleasures are? You get pleasure out of the casino. You know, he knew us. That's why he wants to make a whip and enter us and clean our temple, cleanse us, drive out from us all that is not allowing us to lead a life that Jesus wants us to have, a life of peace. Now that leads me to another point that I wanted to make with all of you. If your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you have to have a different attitude than the attitude in the world. During Jesus' time, the attitude was it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Don't matter. We know that that's not true. That's the way the Greeks and the Romans lived. They lived with the attitude that all they needed to care for was their soul. We know that that's not the case. In order to care for our soul, we have to care for our body. The Romans lived very loose lives, very perverted lives. You know, you've heard of the Roman baths and all sorts of other things. They had no morals when it came to their body because they didn't believe that what they did with their body affected their soul, their spirit. This idea of the human being being more than just their body having a soul is not a Christian attitude. It has been present in, in the history of the human race from the very beginning that we are more than just our bodies. But Christianity is different in that it says that your body does matter. What you do with your body is very important. Health of the body leads to health of the mind. Healthy body, healthy mind. And that your mental health has a lot to do with your bodily health, i.e. why exercise is so very important. Eating correctly is so very important. Losing weight is so very important. Not eating junk is so very important. Caring for your body, because when you care for your body, you care for your soul. Not getting drunk, not using drugs. All of that is so extremely important. 
You have to take care of your body in order to take care of your soul. And now the other thing that is so very important for us to realize is that in the first chapter, first, um, first Corinthians 6, uh, when Paul speaks about our body being the temple of the Holy Spirit, he proceeds all of this by talking about sexual immorality. And he says, everything is lawful for me, but not everything is beneficial. So you may be able to do whatever you want, but it doesn't mean it's good for you to do whatever you want. You're a free person. In other words, you can sleep around if you want to, but it's not good for you. You get sick that way in more ways than one, not just because you may catch an STD, but you get sick in the mind. You get sick. Everything is lawful for me, but I will not let myself be, be dominated by anything, Paul says. Just because I can do something doesn't mean it's good for me to do it. Nobody dominates me except my love for God. God is the only master of my life. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. But God will do away with both the one and the other. The body, however, is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. God raised the Lord and will also raise us in our body by His power. We have a big problem in our church here at Holy Family with childhood obesity. Lots of kids who are very obese because their parents feed them whatever. My child wants to eat McDonald's all the time, so I'm going to give them McDonald's because if they if they don't get McDonald's, then they start to cry. And I always say, well, do they cry blood? Do they cry tears of blood? They're going to throw a tantrum. Your kids don't cry tears of blood. Let them cry. Later on, they get diabetes. And then who cries? You do. First you give them McDonald's all the time. And then when they get diabetes, then you cry. Or you allow them to play violent video games. And then when they turn out to be violent, oh, but they cry if they don't get their video games. It's either you make your children cry today or later on they will make you cry. So you got to choose either I make them cry today with the word no or later on they're going to make me cry because of the results. First Corinthians 6, very powerful. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take Christ's members and make them the members of a prostitute? Speaking of a prostitute, these are not my words. You know, people get very offended and I say, stop prostituting yourself. This is what the Bible says. Stop prostituting yourselves, Paul tells us. Stop selling yourself, in other words. Of course not, and he puts an exclamation point. Or do you not know that anyone who joins himself to a, prostitute's, to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For the two, it says, will become one flesh. 
but whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Can't put it any more beautifully than this. When I sell myself, you know, I become one with my work. It's not just, you know, sexual stuff. There's other ways. You know, when I sell myself to the casino, I become one with the casino. It's all that's flowing through me. When is the next time that I'm going to go and visit my machine? It's interesting. I, I, I met the gen one of the gentlemen. He has a big business here. In, uh, and he designs the machines in the casinos, the, the, the slot machines. And he says, the aim of these machines to design them, he's a Harvard-educated uh, PhD doctor, very smart man. You have to be super smart to design these things. Uh, and the aim of these machines is to get you to fall in love with the machine. So that when you enter the casino, the, the first thing you want is, I'm going to my machine. And isn't this the way people talk around here? Father, I found my machine. It pays. It gives me. It's my machine. That's the way people talk. You know that you're all smiling because it's exactly how people talk. I had somebody call me. In fact, it's a priest friend of mine from California. And uh, see, just because you're a priest, you're not immune to uh, selling yourself, right? Uh, in all sorts of ways to all sorts of things. And he says, I have, he was visiting here in Vegas. I have found my machine. <laughs> I have found my machine. It's exactly what the Bible talks about. And so this, this was, and uh, so many people think, you know, that they're anonymous and so on. Um, he was staying at the Paris, him and, a, and another friend of his. I didn't know the other priest that was with him. And they, I guess they figured out that, you know, you, you sit in front of the machine and you keep playing and then they bring you the drinks. And it's like you give a tip and then they give you the drink. And so I went to visit them to say hello. And they don't know that I, I'm... I know lots and lots of people being a priest here in Las Vegas, lots of people, including the workers in the casinos, because many of the workers uh, are parishioners, either here or in other churches that I have served at, or that I continue to serve at or help out at. And so they, they both tell me, isn't this wonderful? Isn't this just great that nobody knows us here? <laughs> and at that, uh, I saw one of the um, one of the cocktail waitresses, and I recognized her from uh, Christ the King Parish. And I went up to her, and she said, "Oh, hello, Father Adam." I said, "Hi, it's good to see you." <gasps> and she says, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, I'm visiting a couple of friends of mine. And listen, and they're priests. And you see them over there? They're sitting right there." And I said, can you do me a big favor? Can you do me a huge favor? Go up to them and say, hello, father. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say, if looks could kill, these two would have killed me. I thought they were they were going to hide underneath the carpet in the casino <laughs> after this experience. But the Bible says, whatever you do in the dark shall come into light. You think you're anonymous. You think what you're doing, you think your sinful action or your sinful life will never be discovered. That's what you think, but it will be discovered. You can fool everybody, but you ain't ever going to be able to fool God. God knows everything. That's why the ending of the Gospel that we have read from the Gospel of John is so important. God knows us. Jesus knows you. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all.
and he knows us and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. He knows how we are. He knows that we are corrupt people and that we have this drive from the very beginning towards sin. In theological language it's called concupiscence. It means you, you, there's always that, uh, that uh, delicious aspect of sin. There's always that uh, uh, un aspecto appetitoso. There's this uh, uh, appetitive, I don't know if this is the correct word of saying it in English, but that, that sin always tastes great or that it, 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 it convinces you that, it's, that, it's, that it tastes well. So there's that drive inside of you. We're always driven to that. That's why we need more God, always. The only way to combat this is more God and more Bible. So, but whoever is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Avoid immorality, Paul says here. The Bible says, avoid immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you've been purchased at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. That's why you should look well. Bathe. Use deodorant. It's very important. Buy perfumes even if you buy them at the dollar store. <laughs> it's very important to take care of our body. Dress well. That's a very important thing. Go to the beauty shop, get your hair fixed. Nothing wrong with that. Wear makeup. There's nothing wrong with that. Those, those things are wonderful. We glorify God in our body. When I just roll over from bed and come to church on Sunday, what, what statement is that making? Or we're coming flip-flops. Some people, you know, when they come to church, I sometimes feel like, uh, especially here during the summer in Vegas, uh, first they have to put Crisco on their body in order to get into their, their dresses. There's a YouTube video of a priest who was giving communion. And uh, he's giving, he, he, he gives communion, and the communion because of the way the person is, the, the lady was dressed, fell into the, the, the cleavage. He didn't know what to do because he wanted to rescue Jesus. <laughs> but all kidding aside, um, you know, at baptisms, we have baptisms here every single Saturday. It, uh, and people have their children baptized and most often, I would say probably 90% of the time, the godparents or the parents don't practice their faith. You know, they just do it because of the party or the tradition or to please their parents, which is no reason to have your child baptized. I'm happy they're having their children baptized. It's a wonderful thing. At least there's some sort of a, a seed of faith that is still there, so that's wonderful. But you should see the way people come dressed. My goodness. It's like, I wanna say, did you, are you missing half of the dress? Did you forget to put half of it on? <laughs> so the one time I'm baptizing, you know, you know how we baptize, we say that you pour the water on the head of the baby. And you say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the Godmother comes, and obviously she's very, she's dressed in one of these Crisco first dresses, I call them. And uh, 
she's very voluptuous, okay, and showing everything. And uh, she's holding the baby over the, over the baptismal font. And I'm pouring the water, right? And I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. And I say, oh my God, that's not the head of the baby. <laughs> Turn this off. <laughs> but it's not as bad as what happened to one of my friends in Massachusetts. He's giving communion, you know, and you know how we give communion. We say the body of Christ, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, and one of these Crisco first people comes up, one of these Crisco ladies comes up and he's giving communion. You know, we're all sinful people, all of us. That's why we have to have custody of the eyes. It's very hard many times, right? And so he's giving communion, the body of Christ, the body of Christ, and this, you know, scadly dressed lady comes up and he says, Christ, what a body! <laughs> <laughs> All of this to illustrate uh, the need for us to take care of our bodies, to dress well, make sure that we are very conscious of that. Let me, I wanted to end today, and I'm sorry that I'm taking a little bit more time, uh, but I, I need to finish what I have prepared for you today, uh, even though we had some problems to start, but you all seem very awake, so that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> a little humor wakes you up. But uh, I wanted to end by telling you about uh, Paul. Remember when Paul was converted, and his conversion is recounted in the Acts of the Apostles, which is uh, right after the Gospels. The first book that you come across is the book of Acts. Chapter 9. And so listen to this. Now Saul, because before he was Paul, he was Saul. Jesus changes his name as a sign that he's born again, that he's a new creature. It's very important. So he says, Now Saul, still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, that if he should find any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. Christianity originally was not called Christianity, it was called the way. Why is it called the way? Because it's the way we're supposed to live. It's the, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it's the way to live, Christianity. So, that he might bring them back to Jerusalem in chains. On his journey, as he was nearing Damascus, a light from the sky suddenly flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, who was Saul persecuting? Who was Paul persecuting? He was persecuting the members of the way. He was persecuting the Christians. Are you... Getting this right now? But what is Jesus saying? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I hope there's a light bulb in there right now. If you hadn't have it, if you hadn't had it before. Jesus is equating himself with us. We are Jesus. He said, Who are you, sir? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So Jesus, his body, is the church, and we are the church. Not this building, not the Catholic church, or any other church, or any other denomination. As followers of the Lord Jesus, all of us, 
whether we're Catholic or Evangelical or Christian, whoever is a follower of Christ is a member of his body. We are all Christ's body. All of us. So Jesus doesn't have a body here other than yours. Huh? So what are you doing with that body? Not just how you're eating, but what are you spilling from that body in terms of your words, your actions. Jesus doesn't have any other words or mouth or tongue than yours. You are Christ's body. We have to care for it. Care for that body as we pray. Thank you, Lord, today for our time together, for the inspiration that we have received from this word. We are your temples. We are the temple of your spirit that is dwelling, dwelling within us. You dwell in us, O oh Lord. Your Holy Spirit dwells in us. So allow that Holy Spirit to move within us and to compel us to allow the Lord to come into our temple with a whip and to drive out with a whip all that is inside that's unclean all the dirtiness in there, the dirty animals that are inside of us. All those tables of money to be overturned. The marketplace that has been inside of us to be turned into a holy place for God. To overturn the tables on which we're present. Envy and jealousy and hate and resentment and grudges and to overturn those tables and place tables of living waters that on our table there may be glasses filled with living water life-giving water the water that gives us peace all of which we ask in your holy name amen